You are listening to part one of two of our conversation with Chris Beche. Welcome to Sky Blue Symposia, a convivial gathering for stimulating conversation and a free exchange of ideas. We're so glad you could join us, friends. I'm Susan, your host, and here at our roundtable are Bridge, Sabelle, and Chipper. And today, Chris Beish is kind enough to join us for a new symposium as we continue consciously exploring. Welcome, Chris. It's so nice to have you with us. Thank you, Susan. It's a real pleasure to be part of your conversation today. Well, we've been anticipating this, and uh, we're all very interested in your field, so I think we're going to have a cracking time. Good. But I'd like to start off by talking a bit about Stanislav Grof's, his extraordinary accomplishments as a scholar, healer, pioneer of transpersonal theory and practice. I wonder if you'd be uh, happy to tell us a bit about Stan's work and most especially how it's influenced your path, your decisions, and your use of uh, psychedelic inquiry. Well, Stan's been a, a huge influence on my life. Uh, I met Stan's work, his books, at the beginning of a series of books when I first came out of graduate school in 1978. And his work and Ian Stevenson, the scholar on reincarnation, but particularly Stan's work, changed the direction in the course of my personal and professional life. Stan is a psychiatrist and the foremost authority of the uh, influence of LSD and psychedelics in general on consciousness and the uh, integrating of psychedelics into the psychotherapeutic process. He had been working for many years in Czechoslovakia uh, at a psychiatric institute. He came to the United States and was the director of research at Spring Grove Hospital in Baltimore. And after a number of years there, he went to Esalen, where he was a senior research fellow and worked for many years in that peculiar, that very distinctive hotbed of humanistic and transpersonal psychology uh, that we all know and love as Esalen. Mm. He has written over a dozen books. Uh, I think he's really one of the most seminal thinkers in psychology and consciousness studies. He's was the president for many years of the International Transpersonal Association, co-founder of Transpersonal Associ- Psychology with uh, Maslow, and the ITA, the International Transpersonal Association, bringing um, transpersonal psychology and consciousness studies around the world and the series of conferences held in multiple countries. He's just been a, a seminal thinker, and what he did for me was when I came out of graduate school, I was a a very well-educated, atheistically inclined agnostic. I had assimilated the the modern and postmodern critique of religion, and I was uh, trained as a philosopher of religion. I had assimilated that critique uh, moving from medieval theology and and the Protestant Reformation and the emphasis on scripture and then um, the social and scientific and psychological critique of religion. And then I met Stan's work, and Stan uh, basically put in front of me not only an extraordinary model of consciousness, but he outlined a methodology for using psychedelics to explore the deep recesses of consciousness, uh, both for therapeutic purposes, but eventually the therapeutic trajectory, when one goes deep within, it's like the bottom of your, there is no bottom to your mind. You drop right out of the 
personal psyche into the vast uh, expanse of the mind of the universe itself. So mm -hmm. as a philosopher, I mean, I mean, I'm not a therapist and, and uh, have not primarily been concerned with exploring psychedelics potential uh, to heal. But I've been a philosopher, and so my interest has been to use psychedelics to explore the deep structure of consciousness, to explore those non-ordinary states of consciousness through which we can experience the deeper structure of reality itself. Uh, now, of course, that involves a lot of healing, uh, but healing in a shamanic sense, going beyond you know conventional Western senses of healing. Healing of not only the psyche, but healing of the soul, but then uh, exploring healing at a deep existential level as one explores the very structure of, of uh, well, of the universe. And I just yes. couldn't pass that opportunity down. So my problem was, it was 1978, we were past the, the Timothy Leary era and the, all the, we're past the 60s. Things had calmed down some, and my government had made psychedelics illegal. Mm -hmm. And so I had a, a hard choice to make. And the choice I made was to uh, conscientiously and respectfully use these substances in a um, systematic 20-year-long uh, inquiry, which I kept separate and out of my professional life as much as possible. I'm, a, I'm an academic, so I'm a university professor here in Ohio. But in my background life, I began this regimen of systematically exploring the deeper reaches of consciousness. And uh, that influence, I brought that into my academic work in a very modest way. But it's really been only now uh, that I've retired that I'm trying to give a systematic accounting of the full nature of that journey that I went on. That is fabulous, absolutely fabulous. Um, and it's so needed right now, and I think the time is actually ripe for this. And uh, as we were discussing before we started the, the symposium, it seems that ayahuasca is the... Uh, path that is most available to people, at least in North America. And, uh, but I think people will find yes. their own way to whatever mm -hmm. they need, whatever they can to open up these avenues. I think we're, we're starving for it. Yes. And, yes. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so I appreciate very much what you're saying. And Sabelle, you had the next question you were going to ask? Yeah. Um, so, Chris, for a beginner, what actually happens in a psychedelic session? And what's the difference between using psychedelics recreationally or using them therapeutically or spiritually? Yeah. Well, uh, there are many different psychedelics, of course. And so if we were to take this conversation down to a more precise level, we'd have to discuss specific psychedelics and how they interact with consciousness. Um, but generally, the category of drugs that we call psychedelics are, uh, are consciousness amplifiers. They, they are amplifiers and catalysts of consciousness so that what they do is hypersensitize consciousness with a particular perhaps a tilt one way or the other. But they hypersensitize consciousness so that what happens in a session is actually not simply a function of the psychedelic, but it's a the function of consciousness itself. So consciousness becomes hyper-energized, hyper-sensitized in a very short period of time. And then there is a, uh, a confrontation, the, the deeper contents of the what is previously we would call, you know, the unconscious or the contents of the unconscious begin to surface into one's awareness and one literally becomes aware of dimensions of one's mind that one previously had not been aware of. If you take psychedelics recreationally, uh, you basically, most people would be trying to stay in contact with the physical world and stay in, con in the identity of their ego 
and then they're entertaining the ego by having some type of hallucinatory experience where there is a blending between the what's arising from the unconscious and one's physical environment. And there is a tendency to sort of uh, often focus on uh, aesthetic aspects, uh, visual aspects, hallucinatory aspects, engaging in sensory awareness through music or sight or sound. And uh, or if there is a kind of uh, therapeutic aspect, it's engaging the surface of consciousness, the psychodynamic level, one's personal history. Um, a second modality of working well, is working therapeutically and working spiritually, what I would call m much more serious work, where you try to harness all that energy of that hypersensitivity. So you isolate yourself from the physical world. People will work at night. Uh, they'll work. You basically create a psychological space of the, the kivas of the southwestern uh, Native Americans, where you isolate yourself from the world. You're wearing headphones. Uh, you're wearing eye shades. You're listening to very carefully scripted music. Uh, you have a sitter uh, where you basically create conditions where you provide maximal confrontation with the content of your consciousness. Uh, that opens up depths which very seldom surface in just recreational tripping. And, and I have very little experience with recreational tripping. All of my work has been in this therapeutic modality, in this shamanic modality of working with psychedelics. And so when the content of one's consciousness begins to surface, um, one literally, usually what happens in the early stages is stresses and strains that we have kept at arm's length or existential questions or doubts and uncertainties that we usually try to stay away from. Uh, paramount, for example, would be the fear of death and extinction. These, these begin to surface and come at you. And how you meet them, if you, if you meet them in an embracing way, uh, one goes through a certain uh, encounter, a certain engagement, where you confront your deepest fears. Mm -hmm. um, you engage the most profound questions that human beings uh, ask themselves, and you let the universe take you where, uh, where it wants to take you. And there are a series of crises that emerge of varying depths and of varying types, and usually, usually there is a, a crisis that ferments and develops into a critical uh, crisis, a critical kind of point of impasse. And if you surrender uh, to this impasse, if you surrender to whatever it is that wherever your session is taking you, wherever consciousness is taking you, you will go through a type of death and rebirth birth process. You'll go through a complete surrender where some part of your life or some part of life as you have known it will fall away, will uh, just combust. You'll die. Some part of you will die. And then you find yourself waking up uh, in a completely different reality, a larger reality, a new reality, a reality that you had never expected previously, and a reality where the universe operates by different laws, and you're, you are a different kind of being than you were in your previous reality. And so, that can be a, a, an exciting and a terrifying process all at the same time. Yeah. So kind of what I'm hearing, though, is that like someone will take an antidepressant and, and there's some brain chemistry going on with this, this medication. Mm -hmm. And even you know, with, with psychedelics, there's some brain chemistry that's going on. Mm -hmm. But you're really talking about consciously taking this and, and moving it forward in a certain direction rather than just having brain chemistry. Is that yes. 
I'm yeah. I'm not addressing the the physiology of of psychedelics at all, the brain chemistry of psychedelics. I'm not really competent to discuss that. I'm really addressing just the psychoactive properties of these yeah. substances. My understanding is basically we don't yet know how psychedelics work. I mean, really, we don't we don't we don't understand. We understand some of the biochemistry of it, but we don't really understand completely how they work. But we've been using them for thousands of years as a human species, and we have a great deal of experience working with them. So we do understand a lot about how they work psychologically and spiritually. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is Susan again, Chris. Um when psychedelics are not used to entertain the ego, sort of a spiritual materialism, but instead the intent is this spiritual process that with an intention of a personal ego death. Mm -hmm. What happens is, is it um, this existential death is that a guaranteed before you can you can move past that that you it is about facing one's deepest existential fears and that's kind of the ring pass knot that you have to go through i think that's inevitable uh i want to if i get lost in this in my answer bring me back to the question of dose in low okay. dose versus high dose but okay. i think it's inevitable that one comes to these uh thresholds of impasse because uh we have to reverse image reverse imagine everything we know about consciousness we mm. tend to think of our consciousness as small and by doing this, we are opening our consciousness to something larger. But actually, uh, I think it would be better to start with what emerges in the work itself is that an understanding that consciousness is our consciousness is actually infinite. Absolutely. Yeah. So it starts and somehow in taking birth in incarnating, we have voluntarily uh, accepted a contraction of consciousness and we stayed within that contraction so that we begin to think that that's what our consciousness is that our consciousness mm -hmm. is kind of person sized mm -hmm. but a consciousness is is really as large as the universe itself so mm -hmm. if one if one starts to open to the natural dimensions of your own mind you have to free yourself from that con contraction so the the easier it is for you to surrender the identity that you have developed over all your lifetime, the easier it is to open to these deeper currents of mind. If it, the harder it is, the more challenging it is. So, yes. but that there will always be a crisis that mm. challenges you to let go of everything you think you are, everything you have known as real, uh, your whole vision of yourself and reality. That seems inevitable if you if you're going to push the limits uh, deeply to basically remember what you've forgotten. Now, you can do this in two different modalities. You can do it in low-dose work where you basically energize the, the psyche just a little bit and you peel back the layers of these contracted identities in small increments. Or you can work with high doses where you basically consume those contractions, you break through those contractions in in leaps and bounds in a way where you force a larger confrontation and explode through those shells and run more quickly and more into the deeper nature of, of mind. Now, and you mentioned shells, mm -hmm. plural. Yeah, lots that of them. That implies yeah. that, yes, that there's more than one. Yeah. And that uh, suggests uh, cycles of death and rebirth and initiation. And does that happen through the yes. course of this yeah. long period? Well, I, I can't let me imagine, back up. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine that you would want to, that it, even we would be capable of doing that in a short period of time. 
Yeah, the universe is so big. She's so beautiful, and there are so many layers of depth to her. She's so magnificent that uh, it takes years, I think, and even lifetimes, more than one lifetime, to explore the farther reaches of her. Um, let, let me give just put myself back in my own history so I don't make false claims. I mean, I made a choice early on in my work after a half dozen or so sessions to work exclusively in a high dose regimen. So uh, that really has shaped the trajectory of my work. I've always worked with very high doses of LSD, kind of causing maximum combustion, maximum explosion, and maximum absorption into the universe itself. It would have been, I don't recommend that if looking back on it, what I, if I knew then what I know now, I think I would have taken a, a gentler approach, but at the time it seemed like, you know, the most reasonable way to, to go into this, uh, this adventure of learning. Uh, the but fool's, the fool's journey, <laughs> the fool's journey. Yeah. And I, what you're absolutely right. You go through what I found is that, there are many layers of death and rebirth that you go through. In the beginning, death and rebirth is often related to your personal identity, your personal history. You're confronting the limitations of that personal history. And then, Stan, as Stan Groff describes it, you go into what he calls the perinatal level of consciousness, which right. is the interface between physical reality and spiritual reality, where the overarching themes tend to be biological birth and physical mm -hmm. death, mm -hmm. overlaid with all sorts of existential uh, death rebirth, the meaning of life, whether life has any meaning, whether it's significant, whether we have any significance in the larger order of things. And one often experiences this existential crisis in the context of actually reliving your biological birth. And one also can be reliving deaths that you have experienced from previous lifetimes. It's a very complex amalgam. Mm. And the reason is because death and birth is a revolving door. It's how we get back and forth between the world of spirit. Yes. So if you are going back through the world of spirit, through the door into the world of spirit, it's not surprising that we would activate memories of how we came back from the world of the spirit into matter, that is, through the womb. So people relive their, their births, uh, and birth is a, is a very often painful and challenging uh, experience. I mean, put yourself in the fetus's position, uh, being forced out into the world. And then when one relives one's birth, one is kind of born back into the states of consciousness, that the state of consciousness that you were in before you were born. So you're in spiritual reality. But it doesn't stop there because, because that spiritual world is so vast. If you want to explore, it has layers to it. And often these layers are... Have been described. Ken Wilber uses the categories of psychic levels, subtle levels, causal levels, and non-dual are absolute levels, different levels of transpersonal reality. Um, right. If one is going to allow yourself to be, to be dissolved deeper and deeper into the universe, one goes through layer after layer after layer, and there is a um, there's a tax, so to speak, as one goes into those layers. There is a, a deeper yielding, a deeper letting go, a, a deeper kind of confrontation that takes place as one opens to deeper and deeper um, dimensions of existence. So death and rebirth in this type of work is a cycle. It repeats itself many times along the way. Uh, and that simply is a function of the the enormous depth and breadth of the universe and of the divine. That is so, so beautiful and so rings true to my own experience. Yeah. 
really, really, really appreciate this. Yeah. Thank you. Chris, I have a follow up on this. Um, mm-hmm. Did you ever reach a point of complete, complete mm-hmm. um, giving of yourself or relaxation, allowing into the experience of dissolving into universe or into source? Because um, on a recent experience of mine, I experienced the dissolving into source and then rebuilding mm-hmm. myself and dissolving into source. And I mean, it was a continual mm-hmm. process of cycling mm-hmm. through, but there was, I didn't have any tax or any, any, um, losing of parts of myself other than losing myself completely. Mm-hmm. I, th- I think many people who do spiritual practice, whether it's, with psychedelics or meditation or long-term retreat, you know, there psychedelics is n- nothing that happens in psychedelic sessions of this sort are unique in the larger spiritual landscape of spiritual practice. There are many methodologies that open us up to these very deep dimensions of life. So people have, and, and one of the most common experiences that people have who use these practices at one at one time or another, is uh, return to source. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just the most natural thing in the world. It is a waking up to who we always have been. We don't become source. We just return to source. We awaken up. We dissolve into it. We relax into it. And uh, when, and as you say, we kind of, you can move back and forth, kind of into the source mode, and then back into the individualized, the catalyzed individual, and then back into source mode, uh, back and forth. And uh, yeah, those those hours spent opening up to that part of consciousness that you have always been. You were before you were born. You are while you were born, after you were born, that you always will be the the absolute source and ground of all existence that which is alive in you and that which is the aliveness in all other life forms um, that is considered one of the one of the great healing and awakening experience that humankind can have to awaken to what you truly are so our individual identity whatever it is uh, whoever we have developed over hundreds, thousands of incarnations, that individual identity and the truth of our individuality plays itself out against a backdrop of a, the other identity, the identity of totality, the identity of source, the identity of the divine, if we use theological language. My there is a sense in much of the literature, the Vedic literature and different spiritual systems, to think that it's all about return to source, that the ultimately the goal of, of spiritual practice is simply to return to source. And if you dissolve completely into source, that is that is the end of the line. There is a there is an end point, and that is the end point to return to source. And I don't uh, agree with that entirely for two reasons. One of them is that um, it's been my experience that if you do return to source and if you return to source frequently and in a systematic fashion, that oneness Oneness itself has many layers to it, and oneness cracks open to to reveal many different modalities and layers of depth, even into oneness, so that rather than think that oneness is, once you arrive at oneness, that is the end of the journey, I think what the universe shows us is there are actually infinite depths of the one infinite ways in which the oneness lives in the universe or lives as the universe so that I personally have given up the goal of ever reaching the end of the journey. I think that uh, the divine is far too vast and far too 
extended a reality to to reach an endpoint of the inquiry. It just it just keeps has kept opening and opening to me. But the other reason I I have reservations about the goal of the journey is simply to open up to source is is a larger cosmological question. I I think we come from source, we come from the one, and the one has birthed the universe, the domain of differentiation, and we exist here as individual beings. But if the goal were simply to return to one, that ultimately leads to the metaphysical visions that have dominated our our cultures in the last 5,000 years, which are up-out cosmologies. You achieve awakening and you leave. You achieve spiritual uh, consciousness or you return to source, you awaken into nirvana or uh, moksha. And you leave because if you can be in heaven, why would you want to be on earth? Because the spiritual world is infinitely more satisfying than we can be on earth. And so all the cosmologies of of Hinduism and Buddhism and Christianity and all the world religions have basically been up and out cosmology. The goal one way or another, even for a bodhisattva, is to empty the world so that we can all become enlightened and return to spirit. But that, I think, is uh, an incomplete cosmology. I think a deeper cosmological vision is emerging more recently now that we truly are absorbing the scale and scope of evolution. And that is the goal is not simply to awaken to source, but to bring source into and empower the evolutionary project, to actually embody, to incarnate the divine ever more fully in history. So that we'll be doing this for billions and billions and billions years more. So awakening to source is to me midpoint. It is the turning point. And then this, the next point is to continue and deepen consciously the evolutionary project. So bringing heaven to earth rather than Bring, bringing to- heaven, heaven to earth. Yeah. Bringing heaven to earth. And and basically creating a greater porosity so that uh, there are fewer membranes between heaven and earth so that one can live more consciously the bi-citizenship that we all have. We are physical beings, but we are spiritual beings. And I think the evolutionary trajectory is towards ever greater interpenetration which is actually changing and redefining what we think of as our natural capacities. What we have, the capacities that we think of as human capacities and are being dictated and limited by our biology, by our physics of our, our bodies, I think are actually simply uh, evolutionary staging areas. They're just evolutionary midpoints that are our senses are evolving as consciousness evolves. And just as we are becoming more soulful over multiple incarnations, literally our, the way in which we see and hear and think and feel the depths of a, the entire project of being human, I think is expanding and will continue to expand so that literally in the future, we will see differently. We will hear differently. Thank you. It's definitely something to work on achieving. I think Chipper mm-hmm. has the next question. Mm-hmm. Chris, that sounds a whole lot like what I think of as as field work. Uh, in mm-hmm. that that interpenetration, uh, that conscious interpenetration of um, awareness of of shared awareness of this individuality that returns to source over and over again. Mm-hmm. That each of us brings in the divine as we're capable. Uh, mm-hmm. Is a uh, is happening quite rapidly over the last two years. Uh, yeah. I, I've talked to people that have become way more sensitive to what they ingest, what they associate with, what they um, uh, take care of themselves with, and yeah. I've, I, that 
sensitivity I've felt personally as a as an expanding capacity for for field work. I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, scientists are, are now telling us that everything that we had thought of previously as particles, uh -huh. the particles are, are really fields. If you get down into the deep quantum level of reality, that particles are really fields. We are, we are, fields are primary, particles are secondary. Mm -hmm. And I think that's true of us, uh, as of human beings too, that we are all interconnected in these vast fields and we are interconnected to our, our own history our reincarnational history through the fields of consciousness and we are connected to each other through the fields the morphic fields of the human of the human psyche and these fields i think are becoming more energized in history that it's almost like uh nature has turned up the fire and it's bringing the human psyche to a boil uh i think that the collective unconscious, Jung's collective unconscious, or the, right. or the 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 mind of the species, is actually becoming more and more energized for a variety of reasons. Uh, so that we, and we all feel it. I mean, we can feel this kind of urgency, kind of a crescendo that's coming up underneath us. <laughs> and and I think there's a. My, my, you know, the first book I wrote was on reincarnation, and for me, reincarnation is just one of the simple facts of life. I mean, and I think we're coming to see that, that the empirical evidence for reincarnation is incredibly strong, stronger than it's ever been historically. Right. And I think there is a, I think that the evolutionary sequence, which is underwritten by reincarnation, this is progressive, becoming more conscious, more aware, more empowered learning from our mistakes, exercising new capacities. There is something happening now on the planet. Uh, there's an interrelationship between the global crisis that we have entered and uh, a deep individual soul fermentation that we have entered. I think the way I, I language this is that um, I think the planetary crisis is driving us past our limitations of the past, driving us to a, a global citizenship, driving us to a, a consciousness of oneness on the planet that's forcing us to outgrow the divisions of our history, of our of our egoic consciousness. See them and I for think, what they are, anyway, for sure. Yeah, see them for what they are. I mean, they're they're real, but they aren't the they aren't the whole story. And I think that there is a parallel process taking place at the very depths of the psyche, that there is a um, psychologically at a soul level, all of our previous lives are coming together into critical fusion so that as above, so below, as without, so within, so that as the world enters deeper, more and more deeply into this crisis, uh, there is an inner gestation which is taking place. So I, I think that where this is taking us is that we are literally giving birth to the soul in history. And by the soul, I mean the consciousness that integrates all of our previous lives into a singular consciousness. Right. Usually we only make contact with the soul when we're dead. When we enter the bardo, we retain it we recover our full memory and we usually give that memory up when we are incarnate we shrink our memory but if we keep that process shrinking and expanding shrinking and expanding sooner or later i think inevitably the process is not just towards more sophisticated individual egos but to the birth of soul consciousness on the planet intact so that our consciousness never is tempted to shrink to the limits of just this body, just this individual uh, physical embodiment. Right. I, th I think we're giving birth to soul, and, and so many people are feeling this. They're feeling this kind of deep awakening in their, in their body, in their psyche. And I think there's a relationship between the crisis that we're all facing on the planet, so that the global, to, in a nutshell, the global crisis is actually the womb which is engendering what I call the birth of the diamond soul in history. And the diamond soul is simply my way of languaging what many people are intuiting, that 
consciousness of a higher order, a right. more complete order, is manifesting in time. And by order, I'm I'm going to assume that you're you're talking structure, structurally um, conscious yeah. of itself. Yes. Yeah. The deep identity, the soul identity, is emerging underneath the egoic identity and it is absorbing and bringing to fruition egoic identity mm -hmm. you know? i think i really think we, like many other people i think we are at a cusp we literally cannot afford to stay at the egoic level of conscious evolution because ego is a divided consciousness which leads to a divided world which leads to a competitive world and a world of rampant consumption and violence right we, in you know, order we, to aggrandize that ego yeah i mean a divided consciousness leads to a divided world and uh an awake consciousness an integrated consciousness a soul embedded consciousness which is conscious of the breath of our existence conscious of the breath of of, of mind leads to a compassionate world leads to a world which is first healed and then carried forward into, I think, into new, in the creation of new cultural forms. I think we are just we are really on the cusp of creating an entirely new cultural form. As many of your your uh, your participants in previous conversations have pointed to. Mm -hmm. Right. It it does seem to be a a widespread topic of conversation these days. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Chris, for years I've been feeling like we've been approaching a collective initiation process. Yeah. A and um, we may have to do it individually to kind of get the ball rolling, so to speak. But mm -hmm. also that as individuals do it, it's done for the collective. Yes. And – but also is – the collective doing it to individuals yes i think I, yeah I, the relationship of individual consciousness and collective consciousness particularly in this evolutionary pivot that we are making is really the the dominant theme of my second book dark night early dawn where here i'm talking about the dark night of the soul and the the dawn of the rebirth consciousness, but here the emphasis is not on the rebirth of the individual or the dark night of the individual soul, but the dark night of our collective soul. Right. So let me just back up and just give you my particular perspective here. When I, I reached a certain point in the early stages of my own psychedelic work where I had already gone through a series of death and rebirth experiences at the individual level, had had my ego shattered in the different ways that it's shattered in this type of work. And then what happened is that um, I entered into what I would describe as the ocean of suffering. I began mm -hmm. to have just for years uh, sessions where the suffering that I was confronting was not personal. The suffering was collective, just vast tracts of human suffering of all sorts of different orders of, of magnitude, just shattering levels. And and first I was I, I asked myself, what are all these people doing in my therapy? You know <laughs> <laughs> what's humanity doing showing up in work which I had previously thought of in terms of individual transformation? And what I came what I came to understand over time is that uh, I may have thought that I was be doing a process of individual transformation to maybe contribute something to the collective good, but the universe doesn't think in those terms. No. That that the universe, the game that the universe is involved with on our planet right now is nothing less than the transformation of humanity as a whole. That's the game. That's where we have to go. That's what's happening. So the collective psyche is boiling and, and is bringing its, its history forward, outpouring in all sorts of historical and social movements as all the sins and toxicities of our past are coming forward. Naturally, we feel this at an individual as well as collective level. And if you do deep spiritual work, 
it's people find in hypnotherapy and in yoga work and deep meditation practice or in psychedelic work, shamanic work, that they begin to um, open up into these vast tracts of human suffering, which in my experience went on for about uh, three and a half, four years. And I began to understand that the patient in these sessions was not me. The patient was some some aspect of the morphic field of the human species. Absolutely. So that it's the collective psyche which is trying to heal itself and taking advantage of the opportunity that I had provided to heal itself. And I think that's happening in all of our lives, that we are all with one foot in a personal world and one foot in a collective world. And so we're all channeling a, hen- a healing energy which is pulling poisons out of the collective psyche and putting healing energy into the collective psyche. Well, this actually answers a long-time question of mine because I've had two near-death experiences Mm -hmm. and I trained as an existential and transpersonal therapist and then practiced Mm -hmm. at it as one for years. But I was in that field of... Um, experiencing things that had nothing to do with me. And I was very aware Mm -hmm. it wasn't mine. It was not only the ancestors, Mm -hmm. not just personal, but the collective. And, you know, I take it back and back and back. Mm -hmm. But when you said the universe may or source makes use of those opportunities, that Mm -hmm. makes sense to me. So if an individual through whatever means, as you mentioned, Mm -hmm. makes themselves open or available, that source is going to use that opportunity. That is really, really helpful and insightful. Wow. (laughs) That, that since we're all, and I think we all chose this, we got knew what we were getting into before we were born. We chose to enter into this time in history even though we may have forgotten that choice temporarily while we're here, there there are no victims here and there are mm-hmm. no innocents in a way. We all knowingly embrace this time in history in order to be a co-participant in this evolutionary journey that we are on. And clearly the fire is heating up and it's bringing out these collective threads where I think they probably maybe weren't as pronounced a thousand years ago. But they're very pronounced now. Yeah. My, Goodness. my students have – they have people who are, are not doing – even doing this sort of deep introspective work. I've had uh, so many students recognize that there is more going on in their pain and suffering and their healing of their pain and suffering than could possibly be explained in terms of simply their own personal life. And I was talking uh, years ago uh, to Roger Wolger, who's, you know, is passed on now, but one of the great yeah. past lives therapists. And he said he had come to the same conclusion uh, that he was working with clients who were just uncovering so many lives, lifetime after lifetime of pain and suffering. He began to realize that there was that somehow in doing past lives therapy, they had become a midwife to a healing that was reaching beyond the soul history, as you said, reaching into the ancestors, reaching into the collective, so that their work may have begun as an individual soul healing, but it actually had had changed into a much larger collective healing ex- exercise. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and like you said, it's speeding up so much now. And it's quite overwhelming at at times for some people uh hopefully there's enough information going out in like our program here that Mm -hmm. give people um some sort of structure that they might be able to make some sense of of things or if they don't Mm -hmm. know about it they feel that somebody else can resonate with what they're going through because i imagine if people do experience it and don't know what they're going through that could be 
it quite dangerous. Be, it would be awful. Yeah. 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 And there are times when when you want you, you may need to step back from the intensity of this work. And <laughs> and, and there are other oh, times yes. when yeah, you, you just and there are other times when your life allows you to step more deeply into it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And sometimes and just take a break and time to integrate it all and be mm-hmm. with it and even see how your life whole life changes as a result of it because it will be drastically changed yes no doubt about it so. yeah chris could you tell us uh the names of your books and maybe just a brief synopsis about them uh the books are the first one is called life cycles Reincarnation in the Web of Life. Uh, it's basically a book on reincarnation. It looks at reincarnation through uh, at the issue of the empirical evidence. It looks at it as a psychological and spiritual phenomenon. And then it, once it documents the empirical evidence for reincarnation, it then asks the question, so what? What's the difference if we see ourselves as reincarnating beings versus one-time through beings? So it's just one of the early attempts to explore this, the universe as a pulsing, throbbing, uh, reincarnating universe. Uh, the mm-hmm. second one is Dark Night, Early Dawn, which is a book in um, the philosophical study of non-ordinary states of consciousness, uh, specifically psychedelic states of consciousness, but integrating uh, psychedelic studies with near-death episode research and out of body research trying asking the question is the is the universe as it shows itself in near death episode research in out of body research particularly robert monroe's work at the monroe institute and psychedelic research are those pictures cohering or are they mm. fragmenting and uh, so exploring that and exploring the the ways in which our, the collective psyche shows up in the work of individuals and the way the individual's work influences and contributes to our collective evolution, that integrated part. Yeah. And the, the third book is called The Living Classroom, and all of these are, you, you can get them on Amazon or other book sites. The Living Classroom tells the story of, uh, it's about fields of consciousness, uh, collective consciousness, the subtler background textures of consciousness as they surface in the classroom. Because what I found over time was, while I, I kept my personal life, my, quote, personal spiritual practice out of the classroom, because it's not appropriate to bring it into the classroom, that was my weekend work. What I found was that the work I was doing in these very deep states of consciousness outside of the classroom began to impact my students in the classroom. And I began to understand and, and to, had to think about and theorize about the collective, the, the nature of collective consciousness, not at, at the species level, but actually at a very intimate level of the students that I was working with week in, week out, year after year. So it's about you know, teaching and collective consciousness. So those are the three. And now I'm going back to the topic of, of uh, psychedelic work and trying to give some type of philosophical description or exploration of that 20-year psychedelic uh, odyssey that I went on between 1979 and 1999. This completes part one of two of our conversation with Chris Beche.